Hello, this is Michael Edwards, CEO at BioInfo Solutions. This is part four in a video series I am doing on crowdsourcing coronavirus data. In the previous video, we described the data sets that are available for download. And the one we described, the data set is given right here. Uh, in this section, we'll examine these data visually using the commercial analytical software platforms Jump and ClueCore to get more information on this data set. I feel it's, it's always important to get a sense of the numbers as a whole before trying to interpret the gene results. You know, what does the data look like, just the numbers themselves? We will spend more time with the visu visualization in later sections that combine all the time points. What I want to do now is just give you kind of a preview of the day one post-infection data set. I want to remind you we are now in the interpret interpretation phase of our analysis. What follows is going to be a description of the day one response to SARS-CoV infection in its host based on the gene scores in each bioset and how these numbers differ and relate to each other based on the exper experimental values in each study. Before I get into the meat of my talk, I want to show you my disclaimers and disclosures slide. Uh, basically, all this is saying is that all the opinions you're about to hear are all me and may not necessarily reflect those of my collaborators or of the companies in which I demonstrate their software in these videos. Uh, also, uh, no one's paying me to do these videos, but I do get plenty of help from the uh, people listed on my title slide. The first logical thing we should do when trying to visualize this data is to see how much data each bioset or study actually contributes to the overall data set. What we are looking at now are the number of genes that went significantly up or down compared to the control due to infection. And again, remember our controls are normal non-infected lung. I also note that the total amount of genes in our data set is maxed out at 5,000. And this is based on download limits that from Correlation Engine where we downloaded all our data. What I first notice about this data set is the wide variation in values for the genes that were different in each bioset. Uh, we, here we have a, you know, the max, we've got this bioset with 4,331 genes that changed significantly due to infection down to, in this bioset, 321. My opinion on this, so there's gotta be some variable that's responsible experimental variable responsible for these differences in the genes that go up and down in each bioset. My opinion, and this is based on all of the years I've been doing bioinformatics, is that the stronger the stressor, the more genes that go up and down in that data set. So in my opinion, these biosets here, or these animals here, either experience a stronger stressor or due to some external factor or internally they just weren't able to re to withstand the infection as well. Again, the opposite would be true here, that these animals experienced a less severe infection than maybe these. And what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to show you evidence that this, this is probably true. But, but first, let's look at some of the other variables in our study. One major variable in our metadata, without a doubt, is the types of animal models that were used. Again, we're comparing the response to infection in primates to that in rodents. There were three biosets associated with monkey that were all in the same study done by the same group. The only difference in these three studies were the types of strain of coronavirus that was used which seemed to correspond to the stage of evolution of that virus. So that one of these strains was, an, was associated with animal-to-animal -animal transmission, another one animal-to-human transmission, and then the last one human-to-human -human transmission. As I was reading this paper, what I see, saw was that two of these strains actually produced uh, symptoms of infection in the monkeys by day one. Uh, which was similar to a mild infection in humans. One of these strains, this GZO2, did not produce any noticeable symptoms in any of the animals by day one. Again, what we're showing here, or what which supports the hypothesis, is that the stronger the response to the infection, which in this case is due to a more, probably a more severe form of the virus, elicits lots more genes that are differentially expressed compared to something with not as much of a response. And we're going to see this in the monkey as well, or I mean in the mouse studies as well. 
We can also look at the types of platforms that were used to measure gene expression in all these different biosets. And if we see here, there was two different platforms, Affymetrics, Affymetrics and Agilent. Um, the AFI software uh, was used to measure all the monkey biosets or the monkey data, as well as one mouse study here, um, while the rest of the mouse studies use the Agilent technology. Um, I'm not going to show you this data and get into it, but what I found was that this mouse study using the AFI was more similar to uh, similar conditions in the mouse than it was the monkey. So in my opinion, the differences in platform probably make a difference, but not that big compared to other variables. Moving on to the mouse biosets, we can see the formation of two groups here based on the amount of genes that change, kind of a high group here and a low group here. Um, if we bring the variable age into the equation, now what we can do is we can kind of see a correlation to that. So in the young animals tend to have a lower response or actually less genes that change due to infection compared to the older animals, except for this one. Um, again, there is a definite age effect with the coronavirus infection and that older people are more susceptible to the virus and seem to display more severe symptoms. Again, this might be reflected in the comparisons of these two age groups. Just as we did with the biosets from the monkey, we can now take a look at the different strains of virus that were used in the mouse studies. Um, there were four different strains used. Um, this first one, TOR2, was isolated from the human virus uh, in Toronto. Uh, we also have the MA15, which was used the most. Uh, this is a viral uh, strain of coronavirus specifically engineered to uh, go after mice. Um, it does produce fairly severe symptoms in the mice with infection. Uh, we also have this MA uh, version of that, gamma, MA15 gamma, and MA15 epsilon. I tried to find the paper for th these different epsilon and, and gamma, but I, I couldn't, wasn't able to, to locate the paper. Um, it's my opinion that they mutated this MA15 in different places, which had a different effect on its potency. Um, as you can see here, what's nice is that the same group tested the young and the old with the different three different strains of, of virus. And, that, and based on my guess, or, or our hypothesis would be that the MA15 is more severe, this mutation made it less severe, and then you do the MA15 epsilon and then you make that virus way less severe. We can see the same thing going on in the young as we do in the old. Again, more severe, less severe, the least severe. What we're seeing, and what's nice, is they're all from the same data set. So it's almost a direct comparison. We're seeing both the age effect, that with age you're getting more genes that respond to the infection, and that you get less genes the less severe that form of virus is. Again, all of these data sets looked at the same day post-infection to the same family of coronaviruses, but you can see a lot of variability, again, based on viral potency and maybe, maybe the susceptibility of the host organism to infection. We can dig more into these, this metadata to find genes and pathways that are, say, in the more severe types, and that might give us a clue, help us understand, you know, how does this infection go from bad to worse? Um, or what we can do is we can average all of this gene expression together and come up with a single signature for the host response to day one, which we will definitely do in the next uh, video in this series. This next graph is just showing you the distribution of gene scores for each bioset across our range. Again, this is scaled change data so that our Lowest decrease to control levels for each bioset, the minimum can it can be is negative 100, and the largest change compared to controls it is ranked 100 for each bioset. Um, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this. I just want to show you that there are two different patterns, as you can see, um, of this distribution, those of the young and those in the old. You can see the young's uh, distribution is, is spread out a lot more wider. It could be the fact that you've got 
fewer genes that are probably differentially expressed and therefore it's only the ones that are expressed the most that are probably showing up in our meta-analysis. And again, you can see this adult mouse, the, the distribution of that looks very different and in the old mice. But again, when we bring our different forms or severity of viruses in, MA being the most severe and uh, MA15E being the less severe, you can see that you kind of get this decrease and you can see it here in the old. You can see almost this old expression profile as you get less severe in your virus, the more it starts looking like the young mouse. And we'll see that in the next couple of slides. In these next two slides, I compare the biosets directly together, focusing on a different variable. In these three graphs, what I'm looking at are the relationship of the animal models to themselves and compared to each other. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but what I want to point out is that the monkey and monkey samples look a lot like each other. There's a high correlation here. And also with the mouse versus mouse, as long as the mouse was in the same age group and was infected with the same strain of virus. Um, where things start to fall apart is when we start looking at the mouse versus the monkey. Um, not much correlation here. Um, we do find that, you know, the highest genes expressed or that change in the in the monkey tend to be the same as the adult mouse. But again, not a lot of correlation. What is interesting is when I do this comparison using a young mouse here instead of the adult, the correlation is much better. I believe the R value was 0.223. So again, maybe this suggests that the strain of virus that was used to infect the monkey isn't as strong as the one that was used to infect the mouse. In these next three graphs, we are comparing biosets to biosets again, but this time we're focusing on the variables age and the strain of virus. Uh, in this first one, you can see we have an old versus young mouse uh, infected with the same strain of mouse, and we can see pretty decent correlation between these two, although there are some differences. And if I was trying to figure out why older people are more susceptible uh, to uh, severe forms of response to this infection, I would look at these genes for sure. Um, we can look at old mouse versus old, but this time the strains of virus are different. Again, this is the what we believe is the most severe form, and this would be the least severe. And you can see that we are getting more correlation than the young and the old, but definitely some differences here. And what I find fascinating is when we take the old with the weak strain, versus the young with the more severe strain. Again, we've got a more susceptible animal with a weaker or less potent virus compared to a more resilient animal with a more severe uh, form of the virus. And it looks like it all balances out and you can see they start to look like each other and the correlation is pretty spectacular here. Uh, what I'm gonna do now is use ClueCore and show you the my most favorite way to view the data, which is through a PCA plot. And this is basically a way we can take all this expression of data and use it to plot these biosets in three-dimensional space and compare them there. So we're gonna move on to that. What you're looking at now is a visual representation of the biosets in three-dimensional space based on the changes in gene expression in each. The closer two samples are together in three-dimensional space, the more alike those changes in gene expression. The farther apart two biosets are, the more dissimilar the changes in gene expression are. Again, you can see a lot of grouping. We, Based on the age groups, you can see that definitely there's they are grouping based on age, except for this one. What we can now do is we can add the viral strain information we've seen in the other graphs that this plays in a, probably has a huge role on the response of the organism, so we can label those. If you remember from earlier, the monkey animals were infected with a human form of the virus, right, given here. Um, we have our young mice, um, this one here, Tor2, the, the mouse that was infected with that. Again, remember it used affymetrics to measure gene expression, just like the monkeys, but again, we're showing that it's correlating or it's in the same vicinity as the other young mice. We can look to see what strains were tested here. Remember, we tested mice with three different variations of the MA15, this being the more severe, this being less severe, and the least severe. We can now look at some of these other ones. 
at the adults were all MA15, the more severe type. We can look at the olds. Again, an old with a severe type, old not as severe. And then again, the epsilon version, which is the less severe. We can spin this graph around, take a look. Um, basically, what this is doing is it's kind of confirming all the other graphs that we, we showed before. Again, the monkey signature is very different than the mice, and you see this huge age effect, except when you use a weaker strain of virus. And then again, you can see the old is now starting to resemble the young. Right now, all this data is based on what we've done is we've normalized the variation of genes across the data sets. We've made the mean gene expression zero and the variation one. This helps to kind of spread out the data, but we can actually look at the uh, non-normalized values, which probably a more truer representation of where they are. And you can see here, so this zero point would probably be, the closer it is to this zero point, the closer these biosets are to the control animals. Again, this is healthy lung. And you can see that, you know, the most change that we're getting are in the adults and the old. Uh, again, not as much in the epsilon. And you can see the young epsilon, which again, the young probably more resilient to the infection and with the weaker strain is the closest to the zero. And again, we can see these monkeys here, which seem to be closer to their controls than for sure the adults and the older mice. Uh, well, this is one way to look at the data. What we can also do is look at it through hierarchical clustering and a heat map. So let's do that right now. What you're looking at now is a heat map based on the normalized change in gene expression. Again, we took the average change in gene expression and made that zero and all these, the standard deviation to equal one. The more intense yellow the color, the greater the change in gene expression compared to the average across all biosets. And the more blue that gene is, the lower the decrease compared to the average expression across all data sets. Uh, what we've also done is did hierarchical clustering, not only on the biosets themselves, but the genes. Uh, it's just a way to group things similar that are similar um, based on the gene expression. What we can see here is that the closer the bars are to those particular biosets, the more related they are. I believe this, this was based on Euclidean distance. Uh, for your convenience, we've labeled these, the different strains that were used in each bioset. Uh, the legend is given here. And also, we've indicated the age group for those animals. And as you can see, based on this hierarchical clustering, <laughs> definitely clusters on age for sure. But what we also see is it's also clustering on the virus itself. These are the more severe forms of the MA15, and you can see they're right by each other. Again, these older groups cluster, but this would be the less severe form than the MA15, and this would be the least uh, severe form, which is the MA15 epsilon. And you can see the epsilon over here. Um, what we can also do is we can change these values to the original gene scores and look at the change in gene expression across all the data sets and pull out gene clusters with interesting patterns. What you're looking at now are the actual true scores in each different bio set. Uh, the more blue the color, the lower that gene's expression was compared to the control and the more yellow that, that gene, the higher that expression was compared to the controls. Um, we can see here now that we're, we've are we changed the interpretation of the data, the clustering has changed, but I would say that the more severe responses are in these groups here, all the adults and the two old animals uh, that did not get the epsilon version. We can look through here and look at some of these genes and pull out clusters like this group here. You can see it's these genes are decreased in the more severe responses to the virus, but you're not seeing it in the other ones. These might be responsible. These might be the genes that need to get turned off in order for the virus to, to have a very severe response in the individuals. We can look down more. Maybe look for genes that are upregulated in these. And again, here we can see that, you know, we've got a huge change in gene expression in, in some of these genes, but we're not really seeing a comparable change in 
any of the other bio sets. Um, lots of ways to kind of look at this, find things that are elevated in all the samples. Lots of ways to cut this cake. Before I conclude section four on the visualization part, I just want to remind everybody that all of these data sets, this data set I'm working on now is available for free and you can download that at my GitHub account. Uh, you should be able to find a link to that in the description of this video. Uh, my purpose for the, this video series isn't to show off what I can do with the data, but to send this out to the scientific community. And hopefully we can, uh, it might benefit somebody that's actually working to find a cure for the current epidemic. Uh, I know I've demonstrated all this stuff using commercial software that you have to pay for, but you can absolutely do everything I've demonstrated using freeware uh, or using programming solutions. Um, in the next video, what we're going to do is we're going to take the average of all this gene expression or the changes in gene expression. And what we're going to do is make a single signature for the day one infection. We will then take that and throw that back into correlation engine and start interpreting the biology in this. And one of those interpretations of what we're going to actually go over are some chemicals we could possibly use that might potentially reverse the effects due to infection that we're seeing in these animals. So I think this was definitely a math heavy uh, episode, but next time it's going to get into more of the biology. And I, I'm sure um, uh, the non data science people out there will enjoy that one much more. Um, until uh, next video, I'll see you and stay safe.